In verse 15, Laban says to Jacob, because uh, you are my relative, that's what our passage, uh, our translation says, the New King James says, because you are my relative. Uh, Other translations say, because you are my brother. Uh, The Hebrew word there is brother. That that would be a more literal translation. Um, This is often pointed out in uh, Marian dogma debates. And I just bring it up to you so you're aware of it, that uh, says that uh, the New Testament says Jesus had brothers, right? And uh, people who defend the perpetual virginity of Mary will point to other areas in Scripture where people are described as brothers who are not actually brothers. What's the relationship between Laban and Jacob? What is, what is Laban to Jacob? Uncle. Right. Laban is his uncle, and he says, because you are my brother. It's the same thing with Abraham and Lot. Abraham and Lot. Abraham is Lot's uncle, and they're described as brothers elsewhere. So you see Jerome employing this against uh, uh, someone in the early church who denied the perpetual virginity of Mary. Um, And so I just bring this for you to be aware of. Um, It's not a doctrine that I I hold to, but it has been a doctrine that was held to by most of the major reformers. And even later on, guys like John Wesley uh, would hold uh, to this doctrine. So uh, I throw that out there for your own uh, cognizance. Okay, in verse 14, we read that Jacob stayed with Laban for a month and then Laban offers to pay him uh, for his services. We could read this a few different ways. Well, well, two different ways. We'll focus on the two. Uh, We could read this as Jacob being lazy and idle for that month. And Laban comes along and he's kind of facilitating him to get out there and do something. Hey, you've been lying around for a a month like a lug. How about I pay you to do some work? Uh, That's one way of viewing it. Um, uh, And perhaps there is something going on there. We see that uh, Rebecca has to prompt Jacob to uh, supplant his inheritance from uh, Isaac. Uh, She comes along and kind of gives him a prompting. Perhaps Laban is doing something uh, similar. Uh, I'm not convinced of this, uh, but but, uh, uh, I'm convinced that um, of, of this reading. Jacob is described as a perfect man. This has been kind of my, uh, you know, I've been banging on this drum, right? Uh, same as Job, same as the psalm in the, in the, uh, the same, same as the righteous man in the psalms. And the larger narrative here is Israel in Egypt. Uh, this is an exile story. And Laban is the Pharaoh. He's the serpent. Um, And so I'm not actually convinced that what uh, Jacob is experiencing here is uh, a prompting from a well-intentioned Laban to get him to do some work. Uh, This also comes from the narrative of Jacob being a soft uh, mama's boy who just lives in tents, right? So he's lazy and Laban is trying to push him to be a shepherd. In Hosea 12, we're told that Jacob actually kept sheep. It's not told here, but uh, this is... um, this is, this is a, a reading that I would reject, but it's, it's widely reje- uh, accepted by a lot of people. Um, I'm convinced that this is a ploy by Laban to reduce Jacob's stature, to reduce his standing. Um, it's actually uh, a reduction in familial relationships. If you just think about what somebody who is a family member does in the home, are they paid wages for what they do? No. Uh, someone who is a family member takes the trash out for, for free <laughs> because they're part of the family. They do the dishes. They vacuum, they va- they're not paid a wage. They're not paid a salary for keeping the house. But somebody who, as soon as wages are introduced, as soon as uh, payment is introduced, they become an employee. They become a servant. They become a slave. And this also kind of follows the same narrative arc as Israel in Egypt. They are initially welcomed and they eventually are reduced to slave, uh, slavery. And I think there's a similar thing happening with Jacob here, who is Israel, right? He eventually becomes Israel. That's his name. Okay. So Laban is making this business transaction, which is inherently less fraternal. That's business transactions are just less fraternal. Most commentators say Jacob was 57 or 77 here, uh, just through various Uh, uh, cross-references with other areas in the Bible. Um, If that's the case, this would have been something of a humbling for a 57, 77-year-old man to be reduced to a shepherd, something 
uh, we see a young David doing, for example. Um, so there seems to be, I would suggest, something of a reduction in stature here. Also, it says that he stayed with him for a month. The last time somebody came from Abraham's household, what did he, what did he bring when he came looking for Rebecca? He brought a bunch of goodies. He brought a bunch of stuff, and he gave them treasured things. We're specifically told he gives them all these treasures and these valuable things. And Laban was there. He was part of that. And it's likely that Laban was expecting more goodies. Jacob comes, but Moses records that he's just by himself. And Laban's like, all right, let's give this a month. Maybe there's a caravan coming with some goodies. And it never comes. And so Laban's like, all right, how about we put this guy to work? That's, that's my take on this. I think Laban is not interested in the welfare of anybody except Laban. That's, that's how I would view this. Okay, um, and, and he's giving his daughters, which I think um, uh, by the fact that he has Rachel as a shepherd, as we said before, I don't think he cares much for his daughter. So he's extracting as much out of Jacob's services as he can in exchange for his, for his daughters. Okay, um, let's see here. Laban asks what his wages uh, should be. And uh, Jacob is the one that suggests working for seven years. Now, some people say that this is far beyond what a, what a bride price would be. So that's kind of interesting to think about. And then also, if you think about this, what it, this is at variance. Per, if Jacob stubbles, even though he's a perfect man, even in the story of Job, Job is taught a lesson to some extent, right? Job has to cover his mouth. So he's a perfect man, but God still humbles him in, in a way, right? So perhaps, perhaps there is something of that happening with Jacob here. Jacob suggests working for seven years. This is at variance with what his mother instructed him to do. She, in in uh, chapter 27, she says, stay with him a few days. Go to Laban, stay with him for a few days until your brother Esau's anger has subsided and then return. So he's, his, his suggesting seven years, I don't know, we would have to read between the lines there, but that seems to be at variance with what um, his, his wise mother had instructed him to do. Um, let's see here. Okay. Uh, in verse 16, we're told about Laban's daughters, Leah, Leah and Rachel. Uh, Leah was the older and Rachel was the younger, like Esau and Jacob. Le Leah's name uh, is, is, is the, the meaning is unknown, uh, but there's, there's a few people who speculate. Some sources suggest that her name means wearied or it means cow. Now, the cow one is kind of funny to us because Leah is the one with the um, delicate eyes. But cow would have been an honorific name in this kind of agrarian pastoral culture, uh, just as uh, Rachel is, is ew, is, 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 a, is, a, is a female sheep. Uh, uh, and, and a valuable uh, thing, uh, Leah as a cow would have been a valuable honorific name. It's not a slight like it is today. Uh, we're told that her eyes are weak or delicate, um, but that word can also be lovely. She, she could have had lovely eyes. Um, it's, it's, it can go either way. And, um, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that she was homely, but it could possibly mean this, um, especially since Rachel's contrasted with her, that she's beautiful in form and appearance. But it could be that Leah has one beautiful feature while Rachel has, has many. Um, it could be that as well. But they are being contrasted. Okay, so Jacob agrees to work seven years for Rachel. Laban, without mentioning Rachel's name, right, he's, he's, Jacob specifies, I'll work seven years for your younger daughter. And how does Laban respond? He says, it is better that I give her to you than that I should give her to another man. Stay with me. He doesn't repeat Rachel's name. He just says, he just uses the pronoun her. Perhaps there's something to that, his, his treachery coming out even in that. And if we compare this with Abraham's servant, um, marrying uh, Abraham's servant coming uh, and getting Rebecca, we see similar things. What's the first one? The first is that Laban's family, there seems to be a pattern of them recognizing the benefit of marrying into Abraham's family, that there's covenantal ad advantages to it. 
uh, in Genesis 24, when Laban's family eventually sends Rebecca off, what do they say? They give her this benediction, which seems to affirm what God has been saying to Abraham. Our sister, may you become the mother of thousands, of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. This is, th these are promises that were said to Abraham after the Mount Moriah incident with Isaac. You will possess the gates of your enemies. You will be fruitful. So it seems that the, the Laban household, which at that point with Rebecca, it was Laban and the mother that were prominent, they understand that there's some advantage. And Laban is saying something similar here to Jacob. It's better that I give her to you than to somebody else. Okay? So there's that aspect. I realize there's something special about God's promises to, to the Abrahamic family. Second, we see this reluctance to let those of Abraham's household go. We had it with Rebekah. The servant comes and he tries to get him to stay. No, just stay with me for 10 days. Just stay for 10 days. And the servant's like, no, I got to go. The servant was successful in taking Rebekah and leaving. But here we have Jacob kind of voluntarily committing himself to staying with Laban for seven years. So he's not successful in kind of resisting this Labinic, <laughs> Labinic insistence in staying outside the land. In uh, Genesis 24, they say to the, the servant, let the young woman uh, stay with us for a few days, at least 10. After that, she may go. So if we push this further, there's this pattern, okay? There's this pattern, stay with us. No, don't go. And then same thing, uh, stay with me. If we push this further, and we, we look at the Jacob tyrant kind of motif here, um, we have the similar thing with Pharaoh, right? Pharaoh is reluctant to let the Israelites go. It's the same kind of thing. Um, and I, 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 I'm not, I haven't totally kind of worked all this out, but um, you know, Jacob is having a hard time leaving this Laban Pharaoh with his bride. And in Egypt, Pharaoh was stubborn in releasing the Israel bride that would be married to Yahweh at Mount Sinai. There's a similar kind of thing there. And I wonder if it has something to do with sin and the devil and the bondage and the reluctance that it has to give the bride up. I think we could, we could, we could talk about the, the dominion of uh, sin and the serpent and the tyrant and the Laban and the pharaohs and the Abimelech and their reluctance to give up the bride, right? It represents sin. It represents the God of this world at the time of the Old Covenant. Their reluctance, I think, and I think Laban's reluctance is coming through in that larger cosmic kind of battle that God is speaking to us through his scriptures. Okay, so verse 20, Jacob serves Laban as a shepherd for seven years. We're told they seemed only as a few days because of the love that he had uh, for Rachel, which is reminiscent of what Rebecca had said to stay there for a few days. But the word love in Greek, in the Septuagint, uh, the Septuagint, it just keeps coming back. Uh, that word is agape. We all know what agape love is, right? That is, that's the deep love. That's the kind of love that God has for his people. And this is the kind of love that Jacob had for Rachel. He loved her. So it only seemed like a few days. Um, it's the kind of love that Abraham had for Isaac, agape, that agape love. So when he finished the seven years of work, he asked Laban to give him Rachel. Laban prepares this wedding feast. Now, the word for feast is closely associated with drinking. It's almost the same word, uh, uh, shatah in in Hebrew is drink, and it's mishtata. That's the, the, the feast word. So this may help to explain the success of Laban's ploy. That it was a feast with a lot of drinking. And perhaps uh, Jacob had plenty of wine. It was dark. We also know that uh, Rebekah had veiled herself when she was approaching Isaac. And so it's likely that Leah had a veil, and he wasn't even able to see. So veil, darkness, wine, all of these things together probably culminated in Laban's successful deception of Jacob. I think we also have echoes of a fall here possibly as well, particularly with the drinking aspect and that being fruit, fruit of the vine um, type thing. Okay. So Jacob wakes up the next morning. He realizes it's not Rachel. He asks Laban why he deceived him. Why did you beguile me? 
The word used there, why did you deceive me, is not Yehov. It's not supplant. It is Ramah, treacherous. Why did you deal treacherously with me? So while there is certainly an irony that we're invited to compare and contrast here, Jacob exercising deception in front of Isaac, and then deception being employed against Jacob, I don't think that this is some kind of divine reprisal against Jacob. I don't think that's a cosmic lex talionis being, I don't, I don't think that Jacob is being punished for his deception with another deception. Um, I think that it's significant that it's a different word. I think that there's different kinds of deception. I think that there's divinely authorized deception against tyrants uh, like the serpent. And then I think that there's tyrants and serpent deception that are entirely treacher treacherous and unjust. And I think that that's what Laban is doing here. I believe that it's the latter. It's, it's this devilish deception. What does Laban say to Jacob? Verse 26. It must not be done so in our country to give the younger before the firstborn. It's kind of this loaded, kind of biting remark almost. Imagine Jacob had told him what, he, what had happened, right? That he received the inheritance, that the younger received the blessing that the older should receive. And Laban says, no, nah, it's not how it's done here. In this country, we don't give the younger before the older, right? It's, it's kind of like he's, he's taking all of that that Jacob had told him and he's pushing it back on him. And also he's contrasting his own country with God's country, right? Canaan is God's country. That's what God had promised to Abraham. And so it's part of this makes me think of kind of city of God, city of man type things. No, the customs, the customs that God has, has set forth, that he declared in the womb of the younger receiving the blessing over the older, we don't do that in the city of man. We don't do that outside of God's country. I think there's probably something uh, of that going on. But Laban says that as long as Jacob fulfills the week, he will give Rachel as well. The week referred to here is this week of wedding celebration, a week of, uh, of uh, um, consummating the marriage. He says, fulfill your, 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 your week of consummation with Leah, and then I'll give you uh, Rachel. So it's not that, it's not that um, he had to work another seven years, but it wasn't that he had to wait another seven years to marry Rachel. Rachel is given after that week. So he's married to both. He marries Leah and Rachel uh, in just over a week's time. And then he works the second seven uh, years while he's married to both. We see that uh, there's these uh, handmaidens given to each of them, Bilhah and Zilpah. This is a custom that is widely attested to in Mesopotamian literature. Uh, we're told that Jacob loved Rachel more. Now, there are a few things to consider here. We have the issue of Laban concocting this treachery, this deception. As one commentator put it, Laban robbed not only Jacob, but also Rachel of a, of a monogamous marriage, right? He, he, he kind of foisted this polygamy upon Jacob in, in a way. Also, it's, worth, it's uh, worth considering that Leah is put into a difficult situation. We don't know if she was coerced, if she was forced into this, or if she went along with it willingly. Either way, she went along with it, and I think this could have been a source of animosity between Jacob and Leah. How could you have done this to me? How could you, how could you have gone along with this? Right? So not only is he... Has, has he, from the beginning, been more attracted to and loved Rachel? But Leah is also part of this, this deception, this kind of treacherous deception. So I think this kind of explains a little bit of why he loves Rachel more, at least in some measure. All right. So this does bring up the, the issue of polygamy. There's, there's marriage of two women at the same time among the patriarchs. We have this, we have this among the patriarchs. Uh, throughout scripture, uh, David, we have it with Solomon as well. Multiple wives, to use uh, language from uh, out of the silent planet, it's a, it's a bent arrangement. Uh, it's a deviation from the, the Edenic uh, order. And earlier in Genesis, we see something similar. We see how, uh, we see the strife and the tension that's introduced into the household when these multiple wives are um, when the arrangement is multiple wives. We had it with Abraham and Hagar. Hagar not being another wife, but being a concubine. And there's strife between the two. 
there's strife between Hagar and, uh, uh, or between Ishmael and uh, Isaac. Discord is introduced. Now, by the time of Jesus, the first century Jews were pretty unanimously agreed that polygamy was uh, not to be practiced. We almost, you almost see kind of progressive revelation, even with the Jews, how terrible they were. They understood that polygamy was not the best and monogamy was better. And so they didn't practice, they, but they, they got around it and we all know what they did. Instead of having multiple wives at the same time, they had multiple wives one at a time through divorce and remarriage, which, which Jesus then poignantly attacks at the time. Um, so uh, we have, uh, we, basically, we are, we are not in the same place as the patriarchs. We are in a more mature state. We've had the Son of God come and speak to us and give us the fullness of the law. And so we are, we are not in the same kind of, um, uh, I guess you could say, infancy stage as the church. Uh, particularly in the Reformed tradition, we run the risk of kind of elevating the Old Covenant over the New rather than the New over the Old. The New Testament clearly shows the, the inferiority of the Old Covenant to the New. There's weak in elementary principles, things like this. Um, if, you, if you look at it in, in terms of, of, uh, of a child or an infant, like the Old Covenant has, these, has aspects to it where uh, God overlooked things like polygamy in the same way that you would overlook a child uh, or an infant spitting on the floor or soiling their pants. But as an adult, if an adult spits on the floor or soils their pants, you're going to hold them to a different standard. That's not okay. We don't do that now, right? That's, that's the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. We're adults now. We don't do those kinds of things. Here the Apostle Paul, he says, He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. Kind of in a, a lengthy passage, but Paul is exhorting us that these gifts have been given to the church to build us up into the mature man, uh, into uh, things that are not uh, uh, childlike and tossed to and fro. Okay, so here's the last thing. I think that there is some kind of typology going on here with Leah and Rachel. I, I came to this uh, independently and I started looking at some commentators. Matthew Henry does mention that there are other commentators who, who view this uh, this way. Paul uses Hagar and Sarah as types of the church. Hagar represents Old Covenant Israel. Sarah represents New Covenant Israel. Hagar's son Ishmael persecuted the son of promise, Isaac, just as the Jews of the first century persecuted the son of promise in Christ and his body. And we can say this with confidence because Paul teaches it in his letter to the Galatians. So given this way of reading these women as types, permit me, permit me to suggest that Leah is perhaps a type of Old Covenant Israel, and Rachel is a type of New Covenant Israel. The older brother, younger brother motif in Scripture reinforces this, and I think we might see something similar here with the older sister, younger sister relationship of Leah and Rachel. Jacob's love for Rachel, or in its typological fulfillment, Christ's love for his new covenant bride, I think, is conveyed here. I haven't worked out all the details, and I would welcome uh, dialogue. If anybody has any insights, I, I, would, I would heartily welcome, uh, uh, welcome them. Another consideration is that Jacob marries Rachel on the eighth day. We're not told specifically that it's the eighth day, but it's after the, the week is fulfilled, Laban gives Rachel to Jacob. Well, what is the eighth day? The eighth day is the new creation. The eighth day is the first day. First day is the first day of a new week, which is a new creation. The, cir the circumcision that took place of the covenant children in the old covenant was on the eighth day. Jesus was resurrected on the eighth day. All of this represents new creation. And I think that there might be something there 
with Leah being married to Jacob, married to God as an old covenant type for this week, for this old creation. And then in the new creation on the eighth day, Rachel, the one who he loves, is then married. And that's the church and that is Christ. Uh, so I think that there's something to this. I haven't worked out all the details. And again, I would welcome uh, uh, any thoughts that you might have. Uh, but those are, those are a few considerations uh, regarding those things. So let's pray. The charge is this. Be innocent as doves and shrewd as serpents. Jacob perhaps lacked serpent-like shrewdness with his uncle and was dealt with treacherously. Laban was his brother, his uncle, his close relative. We all here know of the treachery of close relatives, of brothers, of uncles, of those who are uh, of blood relationship. And so the words of Christ apply. Those who you wouldn't expect to be treacherous can be treacherous. So Christ sends us out into the world like sheep among the wolves, and he gives us these words, be innocent as doves, shrewd as serpents. The world is filled with these selfish schemers like Laban. And Jesus says, be smarter than them, be more holy than them, and you will conquer. You will conquer them. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.